Hello, and welcome to the History of Philosophy in India by Janardan Canary and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Fine-Grained Analysis, Kannada's Vaisheshika Sutra. The 9th century Muslim philosopher Al-Kindi had some strange ideas about music. It's reported that he once temporarily cured a young man of apoplexy by having tunes played on a lute, and in his own writings on music, he talks about the way that music can affect the soul. Music also expresses the character of the people who play it. This, Al-Kindi says, is why different cultures have different numbers of strings on their instruments. So the Greeks, who invented the theory of four elements, played lutes with four strings. As for the Indians, they made do with a single-stringed instrument to represent their view that the whole world arises from only one cause. But we know better. If our survey of the Vedic philosophical schools has taught us anything, it is that all Indian thinkers were not singing from the same hymn sheet. True, the Vedanta school did emphasize the derivation of all things from the one Brahman, or even the identity of things with this source, according to Advaita Vedanta. But ancient India had its fair share of pluralists, too. The heroes of metaphysical pluralism were to be found in the partner school of Nyaya, who went by the name of Vaisheshika. Shankara, the founder of Advaita Vedanta, scornfully dismissed the Vaisheshikas as semi-nihilists because of their failure to ground all things in the true reality of Brahman. But Vaisheshika is actually committed to thoroughgoing realism. Unlike Advaita, it assumes that there is a structured world out there, which is independent of human conceptions and thought. Yet it is also a world we can understand, in the first instance by offering a classification or division of reality into its various types. This task is undertaken in the founding document of the school, which, as you probably don't need us to tell you, is called the Vaisheshika Sutra. It is thought to have been compiled in about the 1st century AD, though Vaisheshika ideas were certainly in circulation much earlier. Its author is Kannada, also known by Ulika, meaning the owl. There are several possible explanations for this nickname. Perhaps it is just based on the name Kannada, which means grain eater, like an owl, though it may also be interpreted as meaning atom eater, because Vaisheshika is committed to atomism. A more fabulous explanation of the name Uluka is that the whole Vaisheshika system was revealed to Kannada by a god who had assumed the form of an owl. Like other philosophical works in the form of sutras, the Vaisheshika Sutra is compressed and difficult to understand. Since no further explanation was forthcoming from divine owls, the tradition usually turned for clarification to a later work from the school written by Prashastapada, who lived in the 6th century AD. In a departure from the usual procedure, this is not a formal commentary or bhashya, but a freestanding treatise, albeit one clearly inspired by the work of Kannada. It becomes the touchstone for later authors, even more so than the sutra itself, to the point that modern-day scholar Wilhelm Halbfass has called Prashastapada the most authoritative representative, if not the creator, of the classical Vaisheshika. Though Kannada and Prashastapada are above all known for the metaphysical system articulated in their works, they maintain a keen interest in questions of ethics and liberation. The ethically loaded term dharma even appears in the opening sentence of the Vaisheshika Sutra, though here it may well have a more metaphysical meaning, as in Buddhism, rather than the ethical one we know from Mimamsa. This would go along better with what immediately follows in the text, namely the metaphysical analysis that epitomizes the teaching of the Vaisheshika school. Our earlier experiences with Samkhya would probably lead us to expect this analysis to come in the form of a list, perhaps with the items on the list subdivided into further lists. If that's what we're expecting, then Kannada doesn't disappoint. The initial analysis itemizes six so-called categories, with some of the categories indeed broken down into further lists. Thus, the first category of substance is said to have nine types, the second category of quality no fewer than 24 types, and so on. 
A clue to the inspiration of this project is the very word category, in Sanskrit padartha. The commentators tell us that this term combines the words pada and artha, or meaning and word. Thus, a category is a type of thing that can be signified by language. The noun owl refers to a substance, the first of Kannada's categories, the adjective white to the color of its feathers, which falls under the second category of quality, and so on. In other words, the system of categories tells us that the world is structured in such a way as to correspond to our language. Once again, we see Indian philosophers taking their cue from grammar. The list has six items on it. The first three are substance, quality, and motion. As we've just seen, an owl is a substance and it has qualities, such as the color of its feathers. It also has motions, like it's swooping down on an unsuspecting mouse. According to Vaisheshika, equality, or motion, is just as much a particular individual entity as the owl. The white of this owl belongs only to it, as does the particular swoop it performs to land on the shoulder of its wizard owner. Though the theory is meant to accommodate such familiar examples, the substances in Kannada's first category are not necessarily even observable. Clearly, you can perceive an owl, even if its rodent victims never see it coming, but from the Vaisheshika point of view, there are also substances that are, in principle, unobservable. In fact, these are the most fundamental ones. They include atoms, space, time, and a pervasive substance called akasha, sometimes translated as ether. Observable beings, like owls, are composed from atoms, which, unlike owls, are indestructible and eternal. But so are ether, and the other more familiar elements, earth, water, fire, and air. This group of five basic elements are called bhuta, or physical substance, by which the Vaisheshikas mean that they have sensible qualities. Originally, they may have supposed that these five substances are correlated to the five sensible qualities, with each quality residing in one and only one substance. Thus, odor would reside in earth, color in fire, and so on. It would be the combination of all five elements that makes a complex substance like an owl perceptible to the full range of our senses. Actually, this may even be the reason for positing five basic substances, to match our five senses. Sadly, it is hard to believe, for instance, that earth is invisible unless it is mixed with fire to give it color. In any case, if that simple version of the story was ever put forth, it has been abandoned by the time of the Vaisheshika Sutra. Kannada does still draw correlations between the basic physical substances and sensible qualities, but he makes these correlations more complex. At any rate, we have as our most basic bodily substances atoms of the basic elements. That is, there will be atoms of earth or water and so on. The atoms are too tiny to be perceived, and in fact have a special size, simply called anu, meaning small. That is, the smallest that any existing thing can be. But how do we know that bodies are at bottom made of indivisible particles? The standard Vaisheshika argument goes like this. It is an empirically established truth that whatever is perceived is composite. Thus, even the smallest perceptible thing, namely a fleck of dust in a sunbeam, has parts. Since its parts are of course smaller than this smallest perceptible thing, the parts are themselves invisible. But according to Vaisheshika, these invisible parts have still further parts. After all, with visible things, we observe that parts have parts, as for instance a piece of cloth is made of threads and threads made up of smaller strands. To be more precise, the invisible particle is a triad made up of three subparts, each of which in turn is a dyad that has two parts, and these two sub-subparts are atoms. So, going the other way, from small to large, we have pairs of atoms coming together, joining in groups of three pairs to form invisible particles, and then combining to form things we can actually see. There are a number of questions one might raise here, but we'll just ask the most obvious one. How do we know that the process of division can't go on forever? Let's grant that there are particles too small to see, each made of six tiny bits arranged in three pairs. Still, why not say that those six bits are each still divisible into tinier sub-subparts? One answer given by Vaisheshika is that if indefinite division were possible, then a mountain and a mustard seed would have the same size, 
as each would have the same number of constituent parts, namely an infinite number. An implicit premise here, made explicit by other Vaisheshikas, is that the size of a whole is a function of the size, number, and spatial arrangement of its parts. The argument seems to be question-begging, for the implicit premise is only true if atomism is already accepted. A non-atomist will say that the size of an object is determined not by its constituents, but by the spatial boundaries of the continuous stuff it is made of. Elsewhere in the history of philosophy, atomists have been tempted to think that non-atomic substances and their qualities are somehow unreal, since the atoms of which they are made are more fundamental. Hence a statement ascribed to the classical Greek atomist Democritus, by convention sweet, by convention color, but in reality atoms and void. As we've said though, Vaisheshika has a strong commitment to realism. For Kanada and his successors, the owl, the owl's color, and the atoms of which the owl is made are all real. Later in the tradition, from about the 12th century onward, this realism was extended even to the absences of things, which were added as a seventh category. This is the metaphysical version of the thesis we encountered in Vaisheshika's sister school, Nyaya, which held that you can perceive an absence, like Ferris Bueller missing behind his desk. The later Vaisheshikas agreed and thus included such absences in their metaphysical account of the world. But we're jumping ahead here, both historically and in our list of categories, so let's turn back to Kanada's original account and find out what categories 4, 5, and 6 might be. The fourth item on the list is universals. These are the general classes or notions under which substances, qualities, and motions fall. There are not just individual owls like Hedvig, but also the whole species to which Hedvig belongs. This might be the species of snowy owl, which in turn belongs to the more general class of owls, with owls in turn belonging to a still more general class of animals. The chain of universals does not go on indefinitely. In Vaisheshika, being is considered to be the highest, most general universal, because everything that there is, is a being. And by the way, there are also universals for the qualities and motions we mentioned before. As we said, Hedwig's white color belongs to her alone, but whiteness is found in many other substances, so whiteness is a general class, just like owl is. Next, Kanada, or his source, seems to have asked himself, how is it that an individual owl becomes that individual owl? If you've been listening to the podcast episodes on medieval philosophy over the past couple of years, you'll know that this was a major issue for thinkers of the European Middle Ages, raised by such figures as Peter Abelard, Gilbert of Poitiers, and Duns Scotus. The Vaisheshika answer is strikingly reminiscent of the one given by Scotus, or rather, Scotus' solution is reminiscent of Vaisheshika, since Kannada proposed it more than a millennium earlier. He suggests that there must be some unique distinguisher, or principle of individuation, for each particular. Actually, Kanada's need for something like this in his system probably has to do not so much with owls as with atoms. Even if one snowy owl looks a lot like another, there are ways of telling them apart. One has especially white feathers, the other is especially tired from delivering the post. But one fire atom is liable to be completely indistinguishable from all the others. Its distinguishing principle will explain why it is the individual atom that it is, just as Hedwig is the owl that she is. This is all the more crucial when you consider that owls and all other bodies are atomic compounds, so the individuality of these complex bodies will ultimately stand or fall with the individuality of the atoms from which they are made. The sixth and final entry in Kanada's list of categories is inherence, samavaya. Again, he seems to be anticipating a problem and solving it before anyone can complain about it, or perhaps someone had in fact complained about it, which prompted the addition of inherence to the list of categories. The problem would be this. On the one hand, we have substances, on the other, the qualities, motions, universals, and individuating distinguishers that belong to the substances. But what connects all these features to the substances that display them? What explains the fact that this particular white color belongs to Hedwig? simply the fact that it inheres in her. This connection of inherence is something real, so it deserves a place on the list of categories. In fact, we can even use the concept of inherence to explain why substances have a special place among things. 
they do not inhere in anything else, but rather have other things inhering in them. That is to say, our owl does not belong to anything else the way that the owl's white color belongs to the owl. Well, actually, that isn't quite right. As we'll be seeing, the Vaisheshikas are very interested in the question of how holes relate to the parts of which they are made. At the risk of jumping ahead again, though only by one episode this time rather than numerous centuries, the reason for this obsession is not far to seek. Kanada and his followers want to refute the Buddhists, who deny the reality and unity of holes by decomposing them into parts, like the chariot, which is nothing more than wheels, axle, and so on. As usual, the Vaisheshika view on this matter is instead realist and recognizes holes as perfectly respectable entities. As we just said, Hedwig is real even if she is made of atoms. However, there is a difference between an owl and her atoms insofar as the owl is a composite being, that is, a being made out of parts. In Vaisheshika, this difference is expressed in terms of inherence. The whole inheres in its parts, much as white color inheres in Hedwig. So if we want to be strictly accurate, we have to say that an owl has both kinds of inherence relations. White color inheres in her, and she inheres in her own parts, which ultimately are the atoms from which she is made. Atoms are the only things that don't inhere at all, since they do not belong to anything the way a quality or motion would, and they also have no parts. At this point, we may seem to have strayed far afield from the concerns of moral duty and liberation stressed by the other Vedic schools. What could such ethical goals have to do with the metaphysical project embodied in the list of six categories, which seeks, as later Vaisheshikas put it, to enumerate everything in this world that has the character of being? Plenty, according to Prashastapada. He insists that knowing the truth about the six categories of being does help lead us to the highest good. It's no wonder that Vaisheshika joins forces with Nyaya, since both promise that knowledge will lead us to this lofty goal, Nyaya providing an account of what knowledge consists in, and Vaisheshika, the analysis of the world we grasp when knowledge is achieved. Like the United States, Gautama has a friendly neighbor in the shape of Kanada. But Gautama and Kanada, and their followers in Nyaya Vaisheshika, also have a serious rival, the anti-realism of the Buddhists. They too promise to bring us to liberation and the highest good, but by unmasking the unreality of what seems real. For the Buddhist, the only therapy for human suffering is to undermine the commitment to a world of enduring subjects and objects, because the belief that we and other things are real and endure through time inevitably provokes needs, cravings, and attachments. Some Hindu thinkers, inspired instead of appalled by this Buddhist strategy, also embraced anti-realism. This is arguably the case with Advaita Vedanta thinkers, who remain committed to the authority of the Upanishads, but think that these texts point towards Brahman, a single reality hidden behind appearances. For Vaisheshika philosophers, a better response is to demonstrate that realism is true, for if realism is true, then Buddhist therapy rests on a mistake. Nor is this their only mistake. We've already mentioned that the Vaisheshikas insist on the reality of holes made of parts, as well as the reality of partless atoms. What arguments could they give to defeat the Buddhist view? And what more can we say about the relation between a hole and its parts, beyond a rather mysterious appeal to the idea of inherence? We'll find out in the next part, as we devote our whole attention to the Vaisheshika theory of material composition, here on the history of philosophy in India. Oh,